um, feedback. Um, tonight, I'm really excited that we have Dr. Sunil Patel with us. And in just a minute, I'm going to have him introduce himself. But I think I just wanted to start this year um, with a, a real thank you to a lot of people who supported this program just by donating over the past year. It's been really, really, really wonderful. Um, we always want to make sure that these programs are free, and I want to share that. But everyone who's supported it and has donated to it, I we really, really appreciate it. And it helps keep this free for parents and patients and family members who really need it, which is really, really supportive. And if you have a little extra stuff to donate, that would be super. We really appreciate it. Um, it's been a huge blessing. So we really just wanted to thank you all for that. <laughs> um, that said, I do want to have Dr. Patel introduce himself. So um, just to get us started, Dr. Patel, maybe introduce us to what you do at MUSC and um, uh, maybe talk about how you got involved in Chiari and CCI and stuff like that. Okay, hi everyone, good evening, uh, Sunil Patel. Uh, thank you, Caitlin, and thank you for the organization to invite me. Um, I'm, the chair, I'm a neurosurgeon, I'm the chair of the Department of Neurosurgery here at uh, the Medical University. I've been the chair for, I forget, since 2004, but I've been practicing neurosurgeon since 93. Um, the other question that Caitlin asked was, how did I get involved in Chiari and EDS and all this? And, and it's really through my patients. Um, I was trained to treat Chiari malformations and uh, there was one way to diagnose it and one way to treat it. And I began to see a small defined group of patients who came with Chiari-like symptoms and didn't have Chiari or they had Chiari-like symptoms, they had a Chiari malformation, and you did the standard operation and it failed. And so I became very curious about that. I don't, I don't like failures and I don't like to miss anything. So those questions about 15, 20 years ago led to sort of getting into it and digging into their history and really talking to colleagues. I'm not the only one in this show. Uh, there are a lot of experts around like Dr. Henderson, who I knew very well, and Paolo Bolognese and other folks. And I just started asking questions. I said, what's going on here? And that's how I really unearthed a completely, uh, I thought uh, something that first of all helped me answer the question for these patients in which I had failed carry operations, but also answer the question about patients who had carry like symptoms and and had no standard or negative standard tests, and they ended up having EDS and obviously the hypermobility and all that other stuff. So, um, and I'll I'll say one more thing: EDS was a three sentence chapter or a three sentence paragraph in my textbook in medical school in 1982. And that's the only education I had in EDS. I think I got the question right on the board exam about what is, what, uh, what is a collagen disorder? And I said, oh, EDS, but never seen a patient. Now it seems like every patient in my clinic has EDS. <laughs> so, and we could write textbooks on these people. So anyway, that's my background. and. Um, I'm happy to be here. That's great. Thank you so much. That was awesome. <laughs> yes, big thumbs up. <laughs> um, so to get started, um, I kind of worked all the questions. There were a lot. There were like over 100 questions that we received. I'm sorry if there's feedback. I'm trying to not do that. Um, so I tried to condense them a little bit. <laughs> but I guess I'll start with some basic questions. Um, I'm actually going to start with syringal myelia, believe it or not. Um, there was a question that came in about really what causes it? Can it be hereditary? So is it inherited? And there was a really interesting follow-up about whether or not it can grow or burst uh, with certain activities. So per, for instance, they asked specifically about lifting heavy objects, maybe at the gym. And should activities like that be avoided for people with syringal myelia? OK. Um... Uh, uh, you, the the question was, is it genetic? And and just remind me, I I should have a pen. Uh, hang on one second. Um, okay. All right. 
so the first i think one of the first question you asked is is this genetic um um to the extent that chiari malformations are familial familial means sometimes you'll see chiari malformations in a, a, a multiple family members i think syringomyelia could be considered familial i don't think that there is a, a specific gene or a set of genes that's been associated with it I think it's probably better to start with the definition of syringomyelia. What does syringomyelia mean? The word myelia is just referring to the spinal cord. And the word syrinx means cavity. Okay, so you got a cavity in your spinal cord. Now, you can get cavities in the spinal cord for a variety of reasons. One of the ways you can get a cavity in your spinal cord is a tumor. You can have a tumor in your spinal cord and the tumor produces fluid and it creates a cavity. And so you can get a syrinx or a syringomyelia related to a tumor. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about syringomyelia related to Chiari malformations. That's different. What happens is that the theory about this is that you have to know a little bit of embryology, but the normal spinal cord has a central canal in it. If you look at the spinal cord, it looks like this big spaghetti that goes from your head all the way down your spine. It's pretty thick. In the center of it is a tiny little canal. We call it the central canal. And it's normally like the size of a pin, okay? The fluid inside the central canal gets blocked at the top. When you have a Chiari, you, you have to think of it as a blockage where your head connects to the neck, there's a blockage of the spinal fluid. Everything is tight. So basically the fluid in the central canal starts building. And, the, and when it builds, it creates a cavitation inside the spinal cord. And that's what you see on the MRI. The, you see the spinal cord and it's ballooned out because the central canal is all widened with fluid and it cannot drain out from the top where the craniocervical junction is. So that's what a syringomyelia is. It's associated with a Chiari. Not all patients with Chiari have a syringomyelia. In fact, most don't, but some of them do, where their fluid cannot drain out. Now, it will not burst, okay? The reason patients with Chiari and, Chiari, uh, and syringomyelia have an exacerbation of symptoms when they strain is not because the syringe burst. It's because <clears throat> when you cough, there is a increase in pressure inside your head and the only way that pressure normally is released see if i cough <coughs> my pressure in the head went up but i didn't feel it i didn't feel it because the fluid could easily get outside my skull cavity go down the spinal canal and the spinal canal acts like a sump you know the word sump so in a chiari patient there's a cork so to speak there's a cork between the cranial cavity and the spinal cavity. So when you cough, the fluid can't pass through. And so it will sort of push itself into the central canal or into the syrinx. And so after a strenuous activity, the syrinx can gradually grow or become large and you can get more symptoms. Now, the syrinx causes symptoms because the spinal cord is, is under pressure. You cannot stretch or blow up the spinal cord, right, from the inside. It stretches the nerves, and so you get symptoms related to the stretching of the nerves in your spinal cord. They can be sensory symptoms and sometimes motor symptoms from the syrinx. Does that sort of answer all the mini questions yes. we had around this? <laughs> yeah, there okay. are several questions in one, but yes. Um, so you kind of talk about the pressure. There was another question about this. Is there do you notice a higher likelihood of uh, craniocervical instability patients developing intracranial hypertension? And what would be the mechanism of that, if so? That's a good question. And, and I'll just summarize it right away and then try to explain. The answer is I don't know, and none of us really understand that, the truth. Uh, there are some of us who believe that when your head and neck when your head is unstable on your cervical spine, then the spinal fluid just doesn't flow properly from the head down into your spinal canal, so you get a increase in the cranial pressure. Um, I don't totally believe that. If, if you have a Chiari malformation and you're unstable, that makes sense, because in a Chiari, the, the area, the 
connection between the skull cavity and the spinal cavity is corked. It's, it's already jammed tight. In that patient, uh, uh, they're going to have an increase in the cranial pressure because fluid cannot get out of the head. And in that patient, if they also have instability, it becomes even tighter. But uh, spinal fluid is like water, people. How many of you can hold back water? I mean, water is hard to hold, hold back. So I'm a physics major, and I don't believe that the instability itself is causing the increase in the cranial pressure. I think there are two separate things. This is a long winding uh, theory of mine, okay? So the question is, in what type of patients do we have cranial vertebral instability? It is in patients with EDS. Ah, so in EDS patients, you can have increase in the cranial pressure, not because they have cranial vertebral instability, but because their venous blood flow is super affected because their veins are very floppy. Everything is floppy in ADS patients, including the veins, okay? Now, if the veins, big veins draining the blood from the head uh, are floppy and you cough, those floppy veins can easily occlude, right? When you cough, your pressure goes up, those veins occlude quicker than, or than usual in an EDS patient, and that's what causes them to have these spikes in intracranial pressure. Um, patients have uh, been told they have high intracranial pressure, they've had shunts placed, but they don't always work. Um, sometimes you can actually see in an EDS patient where the vein is very narrowed, and these patients, the narrow vein means the blood cannot flow out of the head and that causes the pressure to go up. And so what you can do is you can get the endovascular surgeon to put a stent to improve the flow of blood out. So this is one man's theory, people, all right? And let me tell you something. I don't think cranial vertebral instability is directly related to increasing the cranial pressure, but cranial vertebral instability occurs in the context of EDS patients who have vascular problems and blood flow problems out of the head, and that's what's causing the increase in the cranial pressure. Um, there you go. Does that answer it? So, yes. The, actually, there was a follow-up in the chat. Um, so would you say that correcting the instability in an EDS patient, would that solve the intracranial hypertension? Or um, it depends. So some people are very, very unstable and they may be occluding the venous flow because blood flows out of the head through various areas. There are two main pipes that drain blood out of the head, the juggler veins. But there are also a lot of venous plexus uh, veins in the cranial vertebral junction. I know I do surgery there all the time, and there are all these veins there. It's conceivable that if you're very unstable, uh, those veins can get un occluded a little bit and cause. Uh, but I don't think stabilizing it necessarily improves the intracranial pressure. I think the intracranial pressure story in a cranial vertebral junction patient is not related directly to the instability. It's something else unrelated to the instability itself. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask, um, this is really a more general question as well. Do you know how common, do, does anyone know how common it is to have both Chiari and EDS? Uh, I don't think we know. I, I have a feeling that about a fifth of the patient I see with care-like symptoms have EDS. And that feeling is not totally a feeling or anecdotal, but it's my own experience. It came about 15 years ago, as I said, I'm doing KRE operations. I see KRE patients and about 20% of them are not getting better. It turns out that they have instability and it turns out that they have EDS. And it turns out that they probably had more instability or symptoms from the EDS and instability than the KRE itself. Okay. So a small subset of patients with KRE have EDS. 
the exact percent may be very hard. And I'll tell you why it's hard. I'll tell you why it's hard. Because not all the experts who treat carry understand EDS, so they're not looking for it. Now I see a carry patient and I'm twisting their arm and their fingers and looking at whether they have flexible joints and getting a history on how their childhood was, very under it. So a few of us who understand it are, are getting it, but I, I think it's a less than 50%, maybe around 20, 30%, based on my own personal group of patients I've seen. Um, before I move on to some more symptom-related stuff, uh, a question came up in the chat about Chiari Zero. Um, mm. Can you just speak to that a little bit, uh, and what's its relation with syringomyelia, or is there anything known about it with EDS as well? Which is a big question. But. Yeah, I'm glad I'm not sitting. Maybe there are some experts listening in on to this, and uh, hopefully they beat me up for it. But when I first heard of the word carry zero, I laughed because we had carry one, two, three, and four, and then somebody came up with carry zero. And I have a feeling I know why they came up with this word carry zero. Why? So carry one was obvious, right? Very, very clear symptoms, very clear radiographic findings. The tonsil is jammed down. Sometimes they have a syring, sometimes they have hydrocephalus. And then what happened is we started seeing these patients that had Chiari-like symptoms, medullary symptoms. You look at their MRI, oh man, that tonsil isn't, it's down a little, but it's not down like the usual carry one patients they don't have a syrinx i know what we'll do we'll call it a chiari zero right <laughs> well i'm not going to use french here because i'm in public but that's bs okay medicine's known to do that when we can't explain something we come up with a word so i have a very strong feeling i don't like to call it carry zero they either they have a carry or they don't but let's not make up carry zero. However, so this is what I tell patients. I get referred patients who have cranial vertebral instability and they've got all these symptoms that sound like a carry. Oh, and my doctor told me I have a carry. I look at the pictures and eh, that doesn't look like a carry. No, you don't have a carry. No, I have a carry zero. No, you don't have a carry zero. What you have, my dear patient, is you have carry like symptoms from craniovertebral instability because the symptoms of craniovertebral instability are quite similar to Chiari symptoms. So they have Chiari-like symptoms, but no Chiari. They have craniovertebral instability. And then there's a subset of patients who have a true Chiari and instability. So it ain't is nothing, like, nothing like Chiari zero. I don't believe yeah. it. This is the most perfect segue ever. So I'm going to go to the next question. Um, it's very loaded, but how can we differentiate the symptoms of Chiari, um, dysautonomia, CSF, like EDS, instability, and other conditions even like mast cell? All of the symptoms are ridiculously similar. They range from pain, dizziness, weakness, autonomic issues that often refer to um, GI doctors and cardiologists. So is there any way to test for each disorder specifically? How do you do that differential diagnosis? Uh, yeah, it's a good one. I mean, I think, I think that these are very complex patients and they come in with a variety of different diagnoses. They've got, as you mentioned correctly, they've got cardiovascular issues, they've got POT, dysautonomia, they have GI cyst symptoms and, and um, a variety of things like that. I think um, I tend to lump things together rather than split them. And I think this is all related to one big thing, and that is they have a collagen disorder. Um, the mast cell thing is something, there are two ways to approach it. The, the people who believe that mast cell is the primary problem in this will go at this another way. They said, well, that's what leads to the GI symptoms and that's what leads to the instability and all that. I feel differently. I think, I think that this is a collagen disorder. 
And that makes sense to me because collagen, remember, is the most basic protein that is used by the body to build everything in the body from blood vessels to muscles to bones to ligaments anything and everything skin hair everything has collagen in it and when that is not right you can imagine now it can affect all systems in the body right um their ligaments are so loose that they're constantly injuring their ligaments and um uh, and and their gi system is affected because their collagen's not right, their motility is poor because the collagen's not right, everything is sinking, so they get this uh, celiac artery syndrome. Um, they have lax ligaments in their spine and craniovertebral joints, so they get craniovertebral instability. Where's mast cell come in? My thinking is that you have to understand my basic understanding. So, a rheumatologist is going to beat me up if he's in, on the phone or she's on the phone right now. The mast cell is like a sentry cell. It is an immune cell that lives in all tissues of the body. It is the first cell that reacts. So it's like a sentry. You know, when you're guarding a fort, you have to have these little people that are outside the fort seeing where the enemy is coming from and then run back to the fort and say, whoa, something's wrong here. That's what the mast cell is in your body. It's everywhere. Now, if you have EDS and you have these mast cells all over the body, and because you have EDS, your ligaments are lax, you're constantly injuring your ligaments because they're loose, you're spraining your ankle, you're spraining your fingers. You're... These mast cells are constantly busy. Oh, we got injury. Oh, we got injury. Oh, we got injury. So what happens? You have mast cell activation. And that's why some of these patients with EDS have mast cell activated. It's super activated, right? They're constantly injured. Even walking on the floor, going down the stairs, they're constantly injuring themselves. So that's my theory. My theory is that mast cell occurs in some EDS patient because they're constantly injuring themselves and not aware of it, right? Even when I walked up the stairs right now, I, I injured myself. It wasn't painful, but there was micro injuries going on all the time. The EDS patient has much more micro injuries going on. And so they have hyperactivation of the mast cell system. And so now you have jacked up mast cells. Oh boy, that is bad news, right? So mast cells are terrible, right? They're not just the ones coming back to the fort and say, hey, by the way, there's an enemy coming. They're going, ah, there's war, there are them enemies. And you have a thousand mast cells screaming like that, putting out all these histamines and things like that. What the heck's going to happen to you? <laughs> yeah. you're gonna you're gonna be sick you're yeah. gonna get splotches on your skin and you're gonna get and and histamine is bad right put histamine in your heart and the heart goes crazy put histamine in your gut your gut goes crazy so i think this is a cyclic thing right the mast cell person so anyway that's mast cell now this autonomia where does this autonomia come from so this autonomia is uh in these patients um, first of all, um, my feeling is that part of the POTS or the postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome is coming from the fact that because of their EDS, they have vascular EDS, which means their veins are sort of floppy. When they stand up, all the blood sort of sinks to your feet, so to speak. And so the heart's like begging for blood, going like, hey, man, where all the blood go? It went to the feet, so to speak, right? It goes in the gut every, because the veins are not contracting very well. When the heart does not have volume, you know what happens? It's a, well, I guess we don't got enough blood. We'll just pump faster, right? That's palpitations. So the patient says, I sit up and I be boom, 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 right? That's palpitations. So there is a way to explain why EDS patient has palpitations now. What is the connection with craniovertebral instability? Well, at the craniovertebral junction is the medulla, the brainstem, the soul of the brain. The brainstem controls everything, including the cardiovascular system. If you stress the medulla, what do you think the heart's going to get? What kind of message is going to get? It's going to go, huh? What's going on? Boom, 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 boom. In fact, I'm a neurosurgeon. Whenever I poke the medulla, the anesthesia says, what are you doing? The heart rate went up. Okay. <laughs> So, 
in, uh, I believe that uh, in an EDS patient with corneal vertebral instability who has POTS, their POTS is worse when they have the instability. When you stabilize them, they still have POTS, but it's much more tolerated. Does that sort of tie in everything? Answer yes. that question? Okay. Yes. We talked about mast yeah. cell, we talked about dysautonomia, what else? Um, what else did I even say? Uh, oh, CSF leak was something we didn't really necessarily ah, touch on. Ah, CSF leak, spontaneous CSF leak in an EDS patient. This happens. There are two ways they get it. First is the easy one, right? Trauma. Uh, they fall, they bump their back or something like that, and they tear their dura. Their dura is very thin. If you ever have the chance to go to the OR and you look at the dura, the spinal dura in an in a EDS, it's like holy macro. That is some soft, thin, tissue-thin dura, right? You can imagine if that patient was in an accident or a fall or something like that. But because of that, they can also develop spontaneous leaks, right? They can even do a simple thing like a cough. The pressure goes up in the spinal canal. The dura is soft. You can have a spontaneous leak from that. And, and many of them will have these leaks. They develop what's called Tarlov cysts. What are Tarlov cysts? So normally in the spinal canal, there's spinal fluid and nerves, and then the nerve leaves the spine. The spinal fluid does not go with the nerve. The spinal fluid's in a sac, so that sac sort of closes off, and then the nerve goes into your body, out of your spine. Well, in an EDS patient with Tarlov cysts, that sac balloons out along the nerve because the sac or the dura is very soft. So when you get a myelogram on a patient or an MRI on a patient with EDS of the spine, you see these little sacs of fluid along the nerve on either side of the spine. And those are what we call Tarlov cysts. They're benign. They occur sometimes in patients without EDS. But I think they also act, if you have too many of them, they can act as a sump for fluid. And so these patients will get leak-like symptoms from the fact that there's so many Tarlov cysts that they're losing all that fluid from the spinal canal and so they act like they've lost spinal fluid and get partial headaches and things like that. And many patients with the partial symptoms will come with that diagnosis and you have to do a special study or test to find out if they have uh, leaking of fluid. Yeah. Um, oh, hold on. All right, I think I got it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, just kind of coming off of that a little bit, uh, there was a question that came in asking, "What are the common symptoms of CSF leak? How do you know to go to the surgeon or to the ER even um, to?" try to see, determine if you have a leak. First of all, my dear friends, don't go to the ER if you think you have a CSF leak, all right? I have never seen one experience of any EDS patient, or for that matter, any EDS patient with a leak or with um, um, even a spontaneous leak in a non-EDS patient, the experience would be a good one in the ER. The ER is not equipped to diagnose CSF leaks. In fact, the worst that will happen to you is someone will do a spinal tap on you and you'll be like, oh, man, another hole in the sack, <laughs> right? So you want to go to, to people who have taken interest in it and, and can properly diagnose you with a leak. Now, I, I, I can imagine ERs are where you go when you're feeling really sick. And some patients with a leak, they're really sick on what they do. If you suspect you have a leak, you have to stay flat because that reduces the chance of, I mean, I'm assuming we're talking about leaks in the spinal canal, not a leak out your nose, which is another story. We can talk about that separately. But if you suspect you have a leak in your spinal canal and that's why you're having headaches every time you stand up, you need to go to somebody who can truly diagnose. For me, here at MUSC, I like to send my patients to Dr. Gray at Duke. She has a focused interest in spinal fluid leaks. She does a very nice diagnostic testing to see if they have a leak. And it's, it's, it's best done by somebody who sees a lot of these patients and done now. 
not all of you are fortunate enough to be close to Duke, and and there may be other people in the country that that uh, diagnose this um, uh, leak, um, and you have to find that one spot, like where is the most uh, sink occurring for the spinal fluid to to find a leak. There are a few patients that have leaks through their nose, right? Where the leak is not in their spinal canal, but the leak is uh, from somewhere in their nose or the base of the skull. And there you can actually see the fluid coming out the nose. But there are very few patients I've found that have true leaks, even with EDS. I think most of them, their postural headaches are related to something mechanical going on at the craniovertebral junction. Okay. Um, I guess the next question was actually about uh, does a bigger syrinx mean um, worse symptoms? I don't know if that, that makes sense. So, so would a bigger syrinx automatically mean that that patient would have a worse symptom profile? Not at all. I mean, um, I mean, in general, yeah, the bigger the cyst, uh, the more the symptoms. But then I've seen people with a ginormous syrinx and they're playing football. You know, no problems at all. And then you have some with a very small syrinx uh, that have a lot of symptoms. So it just depends on how quickly the syrinx formed. You know, the nervous system is very resilient when it comes to things developing slowly. And that's true for most of the body, right? If something grows slowly, you don't get symptoms. And something grows very quickly, you get symptoms. So mm -hmm. the actual size of it, doesn't correlate with it, but the growth rate probably does. And we don't, we can't predict in any one patient how fast their syrinx is going to develop. Uh, hopefully that answered the question. Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, all right, so I had three more, or four more questions with symptoms. So first of all, can instability cause issues with vision? What would that be? Oh yes, oh yes, very much so. So, there are no visual nerves at the craniovertebral junction, first of all. There is no, the optic nerve comes from way higher up in the brain stem. The ocular nerves, the optic nerves are nerves with which you see. Then you have the ocular nerves. The ocular nerves are the nerves that supply the muscles that move your eyeballs. So now if those muscles don't work right, then you got two cameras, and if those two cameras can't focus on one object, what do you see? You see doubles, so you got blurry vision. But even those nerves are not coming from the medulla. So what is in the freaking medulla, right? You may ask. Well, the medulla actually helps in a very indirect way to coordinate the whole visual thing. It's very bizarre, but um, gravity being on Earth, under the effect of gravity is very important for our entire sensory system, including our hearing and seeing. If I remove gravity, we see differently. If I'm upright, I see differently than I'm upside down. So right now y'all are sitting up against gravity. You got your head up against gravity. If I put you upside down right now, your vision's not gonna be right for a few minutes. Why? Because gravity suddenly changed and the input to the brainstem changed. It went from full gravity to, to no gravity, right? So we do know that the, the position of the patient and the input from gravity is very important in making sure uh, how we see, how we hear, and how we think. And that's why when you have craniovertebral instability, the medulla, which is stretched, which is where the big integration occurs of gravitational forces and the sensation of gravity, position sense, uh, input from hearing, input from the vestibular system about, uh, about where is down and where is up. All that's important in proper visualization. So when your medulla don't work right, everything's going to get fuzzy. <laughs> yep. That makes so sense. It makes sense that you don't. That leads me to something else. Maybe nobody has asked, but people talk about brain fog. That was going to come up, so yes, please, <laughs> go ahead. I couldn't believe that brain fog could, but why not? Because the reticular activating system and everything related to our thinking and the frontal lobe and the wakefulness of our brain is dependent on gravity too. 
we are evolved beings in the effect of gravity, right? So it's not unusual that the, when, the, when the medulla is stretched and doesn't work right, your, your reticular activating system, which activates the whole brain, is not working right. And so it's not unusual. There's no true memory center in the brainstem, but the, the brainstem, you can think of it as, as the ignition. It ignites everything. It coordinates everything. And so if the ignition doesn't work, the engine don't work right. That was like one of the best explanations I've ever heard of that. Thank you. <laughs> um, but so one more question with symptoms. Um, this was interesting. Are there any symptoms that could specifically indicate instability in the lower cervical spine? So C3 and down, perhaps. Or is it any, just Any symptoms? You said any symptoms? symptoms? Right, any Other symptoms, symptoms specific to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how do you differentiate between somebody who's got craniovertebral instability or mid-cervical instability? When it comes to mid-cervical localization, a little bit, you know, they're complaining more of neck pain than headaches. That's sort of vague. And um, the other thing is, what is in the mid-cervical spine? It's your spinal cord. So with the stretching of the spinal cord alone, they may have some arm symptoms or shoulder pain. Um, because nerves uh, going to your arms come from your cervical spine. Um, they may have not much medullary symptoms or brainstem symptoms. They have more spinal cord symptoms. So they may have, they may have all the usual numbness and tingling in their arms and legs, but they don't have the cranial symptoms. They're not gonna talk more about the brain fog or the blurry vision. Although the higher you get in the cervical spine, you start getting medullary symptoms. It is a dilemma for me. There are times when I see a patient with instability and they have carry like symptoms or medullary symptoms, but they also have hyperflexion in the middle of their neck uh, because of their EDS. And you have to try to decide, is it the mid-cervical spine instability or the craniovertebral? And, and there you have to sort of weigh to say, all right, this patient has more medullary symptoms. They've got POTS, they've got swallowing trouble, which is medullary. They've got uh, double vision, uh, brain fog. But so the mid-cervical instability probably does not contribute as much. So it's, okay. it's really trying to parse out the symptoms that way. Right. Um, I wanna move on to more of diagnosis and imaging and stuff. So I guess, to start, um, is there a correct imaging, like a set of images to be collected for craniocervical instability or atlantoaxial instability? Is it MRI, X-ray? Um, I don't know if you want to comment on the supine versus upright or flexion extension. Um, so what do you typically do in your clinic? So I believe upright imaging is the only way to diagnose craniovertebral instability. Why? Because that's who we are. We humans are erect. We carry our head. We don't walk, roam the earth horizontally, right? The head connection to the neck in humans was built so that we could be upright, right? So the best way to assess the dynamics of how we carry the head on the neck is not laying on a table and bending your neck up. I mean, the history mostly t should tell us, right? These patients are in bed. Why are they in bed? Because they don't like carrying their head up. The symptoms are when their head is up. So the instability is going to be diagnosed in the upright position when it comes to craniovertebral. Now, I get x-rays on everyone. I get upright flexion extension x-rays because I like to see the bones. I like the, uh, to see um, just the general alignment of the bones and things like that. It also gives me a sense about, sometimes it does give me a sense about how much cervical instability or mid-cervical instability they have. And then I, I, in a suspected patient with craniocervical instability, I will get a flexion extension or upright um, uh, flexion extension MRI. All, all the patients, I, I just, I've only treated one patient who just could not sit up, no matter what. In that patient, I, I had them horizontal and had them flex their neck and bend their neck back and get a, they couldn't even sit in the MRI, so we got a CT scan. But it was, I was not happy with that because it didn't tell me 
how the the dynamics of that movement is under the weight of the head because that's when her symptoms were the most so and they don't like it because a lot of them will get the MRI in the upright position. You kind of look down and stay that way for, I don't know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and they get sick. But I tell them, I said, look, just a little sickness, but we want to be firm, confirmed. We want to be sure you have this instability. And it gives me the extent of the instability um, because the solutions are drastic, right? <laughs> when we're trained. So we have to be absolutely sure. Now, when it comes to AI, you mentioned the uh, atlanto axial instability. That is not a vertical instability. That is sort of what I call a horizontal. That is where atlanto axial, so at, the atlas is C1 and the axis is C2. So C1, C2 instability or atlanto axial instability. C1 and C2 are a rotational joint. They help you go like mm. this, okay? That you can catch whether you do a uh, upright rotation. That's, that's a CT scan. It's not even an MRI. That is diagnosed by doing a CT, you know, laying down, you look one way, the other way. It's, uh, and, you can, and, and you can measure how much C1 is rotating on C2. And there are certain criteria we have that it should rotate, but not more than a certain amount. And if it does, then they have atlantoaxial instability. Um, two hmm. questions came up in the chat that I want to address really quick. And I promise I'm trying to get to all of them, guys. <laughs> but, um, first, is cervical dystonia an indicator of AAI? Cervical dystonia is uh, a symptom. Uh, it's not an indicator. When you use the word indicator, I'm thinking, well, if you have dystonia, then you have AAI. No, if you have AAI, you can have dystonia. But if you have just dystonia, you may have a lot of other reasons to have dystonia. AAI can cause dystonia. So can craniovertebral instability cause dystonia. So can mid-cervical instability cause dystonia. Dystonia is uh, a response of the spinal cord to something bad going on to it. Okay. Uh, you, so. Yeah, and then the the one I want to get to before we have another question is, um, can you kind of allude to this, but can someone have what appears to be a normal supine MRI on the cervical spine for CCI, but if they won't order an upright MRI, is there any way to, um, I guess, replicate an upright MRI in that patient? I'm not sure if there's a way to do it. No? No, how can you do it? I mean, you've got to have the weight of the head on your neck to see how that joint responds to the weight of the neck and then how it moves. And and so you're putting the joint to its natural strain. And you're not going to get that in the supine position no matter what you do. I mean, what am I going to do? Put him supine and yeah. push down on his head? <laughs> but that's yeah. unnatural, right? So you okay. have to have an upright imaging. Right. Mm. Um, before we move on, I just want to get one more of these questions in. So for imaging anyway, uh, do you recommend any, I guess it's not really imaging, it's testing. Do you recommend any other testing beyond MRI or X-ray or any of that for craniocervical instability? So maybe like EEG or CSF flow studies, anything like that? or if before surgery is considered, I guess, maybe to rule out a different. Yeah, I mean, obviously, these patients come in with a lot of complex symptoms. And, you know, some of them look like they're having a seizure. I had a patient a couple of weeks ago, went in there and looked like it was a seizure. But I've seen patients with seizures. So if you're if you're if you are a very astute neurologist or you've seen seizures, you know, a seizure versus something that looks like a seizure but it is in the seizure. Uh, but there are some, it can be confusing. And so you do want to rule out that if they're having seizure-like symptoms, get an EEG. Uh, most of the time, though, I found those tests not be useful. Um, I think that once I suspect that the patient has instability, then I'm just focused on the instability. And then I look at all the symptoms and, and, I, and I tick each one of them off. 
So I like to write all the symptoms and say, now, if this patient had cranial vertebral instability, can it cause this? Yes. Can it cause this? Yes. Can it cause this? Yes. If it's a yes to all, then I see no reason to get any other test. But if there is a no, now that symptom doesn't make sense. Stretching or bending the medulla or stretching the spinal cord is not going to cause whatever symptom. Then I need to do a test to make sure that that symptom is not coming from something else. Does that make sense? So yes. I don't find the EEG to be useful. I think these patients who come to me, will, they come with a big book sometimes, and it's EEG after EEG. Obviously, in my mind, the patient's symptom was not observed because anybody who observes it would say, that's not, an, that's not a seizure. That's a dystonic episode. Mm -hmm. And sometimes patients have dystonia and the provider thinks, oh, that looks like a seizure. Or even the patient in her family, yeah, he was flopping in bed. You know, you say somebody's flopping in bed, you think of seizure. But wait a minute, there are many other reasons to flop around in bed like that. Uh, and uh, the dystonic episodes of a patient with EDS or cranial are, is a very curious thing. Uh, it's scary to see. But if you really sit and observe, it's not a seizure. It looks like a seizure, but it's not a cortical seizure. So... Mm -hmm. Um, there are a couple of questions about upright. So first of all, um, is it valid if when getting the upright MRI, there was a bar place for the forehead to lean on? So theoretically, they didn't go as far forward as possible. Is that okay? Or is, um, is that something that should be redone? I, I am no concept. So. Yeah. I don't understand the bar, first of all. Um, I am looking for how the bones move under the effect of gravity and and preventing the head from bending down doesn't make sense to me at all. I do get these flex and extension MRIs and God bless these patients who probably spent money out of their pocket um, and there's no bending. <laughs> they're, they're pushing up against a, a bar I want them to look down, and then I want them to look up. Um, or some of them, worse yet, they're wearing their collar. <laughs> I mean, why didn't you bend your neck so much? Well, I had the collar on there. Or sometimes there's a coil, an MRI coil is put right, and they can't bend forward. So I, I tell my, the place that does MRIs for me, it's uh, 200 miles from here. And I tell the technicians and the radiologists, look, this is the way I want them tested. No bars in front of them. They need to be looking straight down, straight back. And, and so the bar thing is not good. Um, and then kind of a follow-up. As of 2019, it was proper properly impossible to get an upright MRI in central Missouri. Is this issue... I, it's pretty well documented across the country. Is this still going to be a problem, or is it easier to get up MRI, uh, upright MRIs recently? I mean, so it's more in general, I would say, getting any imaging like MRI is becoming more difficult by pairs, whether it's for EDS, cranial vertebral instability, or whatever other MRI of the spine. Um, you the the clinician ordering the study has to carefully document clinically the absolute need for it so willy-nilly if 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 they made it completely free for all that everybody can get a flex section and mri that wouldn't be appropriate you know when you get a test i always teach my trainees i say when you get a test you need to first document the history the physical exam, and in, in your assessment section, describe why you think the patient has a certain diagnosis and why that diagnosis would explain the patient's history, symptoms, and physical examination. And then, as a confirmatory to your diagnosis, order the test. Um, many notes you read of uh, doctors or nurses or providers, as we call them these days. Uh, patient came in with this symptom, the exam doesn't, you know, I don't know whether they examined him and we are going to order an X-ray, we're going to order a chest X-ray, we're going to order an MRI scan. Why? What are you looking for? 
you know, when you order a test, you should order it to confirm your diagnosis. And your diagnosis is 99% made by the history. That includes the history of their symptoms, it includes the family history, it includes why it occurred, when it occurred, your examination, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have to create a story, you have to create an analysis in your assessment. Then you order the MRI, no problem. Of course, still it's a fight. I spend a lot of time with insurance companies. It takes too much time sometimes justifying, oh, but you know, and they don't care. A lot of the payers don't care. Um, but um, most of the time it's successful. We're getting so many questions. I promise I'm going to try to get to them, but I want to move to um, treatment options. So uh, what are the non-operative treatment options for CCI and Chiari and stuff like that? So there was mention of PT, chiropractic. Is there anything that people should stay away from and then why? And But really, what are the options before you get to surgery? Yeah. Um... For me, and again, this is one person's opinion, you know, there are several experts. I think conservative therapy should be tried and very well. But even in conservative care, only certain therapists, like certain neurosurgeons and a few neurosurgeons, there are only a few therapists who really understand CCI or instability or EDS or hypermobile joints. So physical therapy for spinal issues is in general reserved for people with degenerative spine problems and herniated discs and stenosis and that sort of stuff. But you need to go to a therapist who is familiar with it. Um, and not, not all of them are. So it's important when you have diagnosis of CCI and you should try physical therapy to uh, make sure your therapist either treats EDS patients or hypermobile patients, understands it, uh, and if not, is willing to learn about it. Because, you know, you could be in Timbuktu and the only two therapists there are treating not CCI, but one of them is willing to learn, call up another therapist way away, just like we do. I do it all the time. I'll call uh, Dr. Duflachi in California and say, hey, listen, I understand you know more about this. Tell me about it. You know, what do you know about it? I'll come over there or I'll send you my patient there, that kind of thing. So if you have a therapist who's willing to learn, there are, and I'll leave it to the CSF Foundation, but there should be a list of therapists who are familiar with it that you can call them. And many of them are very open to teaching other people about it. There are textbooks for them. Now, the prior question was, should we have physical therapy and what does that do? So the problem in CCI is that your ligaments that hold your head to the neck are loose. So let's talk about the physiology of a joint for just a minute. Bear with me. You got two bones, they're joined at the, together at a joint, like my elbow, all right? We got the ulnar and radius here and the humerus here and it's joined at the elbow, you see that? Now, how do these two bones come together? Well, first, ligaments hold those bones here in the arm and the forearm, the ligaments hold it together, that's the joint. Those ligaments have to be flexible, but not too stretchable. So they're like ropes. They're like strong rope. You cannot stretch a rope, right? You ever tether a boat with a stretchable rope? No. The rope's got to be flexible, but not stretchable. So that, that's the best way to think of ligaments. Then the muscles that go across that joint can move that joint. All right. Now in CCI or any instability in an EDS patient, any joint, their ligaments are not like ropes. They're like elastic bands, too flexible. Well, then how, how are the two bones going to be held together? And what's going to hold them together? Well, the other thing that goes around the joints is the muscles. So what happens with therapy is that the therapists are basically teaching the person how to use their muscles to hold their head, to use their hip, to use their knees. 
how to functionalize the muscles around weak ligament joints, joint ligaments to, to do it. So a lot of the therapy is focused on postural therapy, how to hold your head, how to not slouch. Mama always said, sit up straight, boy. And we never listened. But now in this situation, you have a therapist saying, this is how you hold your head and this is how you train and you do isometric. I won't go into that. I don't even understand half the stuff my therapist teaches these patients. But so therapy is very important. Now chiropractors. I'm not going to poo-poo chiropractors. I'm not. There are many chiropractors who understand hypermobile joints, and, um, but many who don't. We'll, there are many who actually diagnose instability. I've got three chiropractors I know around who diagnose instability and will send the patient, you know, that C1, C2 is off, Patel. Why do you think? Is it off because it just sort of nudged out of place or is it nudged out of place because the ligaments are loose? So does this patient have hypermobile joint syndrome or EDS or what? But there are chiropractors who don't. So you have to be careful, right? When you go to a chiropractor, if, uh, if you go to them and your symptoms get worse, talk to them, ask them and say, listen, I got worse. Do you think I have hypermobile joints? Do you think I have EDS? And if they go, oh, huh? then you say, bye-bye. But if they say, hmm, that's curious. I've got patients like that and I treat them. Maybe we should look for hypermobility. We're, you know, they, they treat a lot of spine patients and I would, fail, I, would, it, I would find it hard to believe that a chiropractor has never come across hypermobile joint patients. They see more patients than I do. So surely they, they treat these patients, but you have to be careful, right? So there are chiropractors who don't bother I call them the factory line chiropractors, you know, 50 patients in the waiting room, boom, 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 boom. They don't uh, talk to the patient, et cetera. So, yeah. Um, hope that ends. I hope there are no chiropractors in the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, but it was a good, it was a fair answer. Um, there was a question uh, came up in the chat and someone had asked it earlier about um, prolotherapy and stem cell therapy, um, I guess to reduce inflammation, is something like that effective enough to avoid surgery long-term or what would you say? Well, from my own experience, I've seen patients who get prolotherapy, first of all. And, and uh, let, me, let me make the comment on prolotherapy first by the disclaimer that I, I do not understand for prolotherapy, nor do I do it. That doesn't mean I think it's bad. I don't think it's bad because there are patients who've had prolotherapy. I've had families where one sibling had it and did great and the other one had it and didn't do well. So obviously it's a hit or miss for them too. I think they are trying to reduce the inflammation and as I said, the, it's a cyclic thing in these patients, right? So the ligaments loose, they injure it, it gets inflamed, the inflammation causes it gets looser, et cetera. So they're breaking the cycle, so to speak, with this anti-inflammatory injection of, I don't know what they put, some hyper, concentrated glucose or whatever. I've never seen anybody get worse from prolotherapy. I think they probably just progress in their illness and that's why they feel like they're getting worse. Again, there also, there are people who are very good with it, who are very conserved with it, doing it. I only know of one person that uh, I share patients with. He's not even here in Charleston, uh, you know, in Florida. And we talk and share a lot of patients, very conservative, understands it's a good history, listens, and is very selective about who he does it on, who he doesn't, and is very honest with the patient about the possibility of how much it'll help. The fact that it's not paid by the or insurance company is a curious thing. Sometimes all these therapies, like plural therapy, that are not approved make you wonder, why didn't you do the science? Why don't you do the science? Or why don't you write about this and publish it and that sort of stuff? So I don't know the answer to it. You know, it's just that it is expensive. You have to pay cash. Because if you want it, you want to make sure that you get the fair opinion. And other than making sure that the, the doctor who's doing it has listened very carefully to your story, and acknowledges your story. 
Um, I don't know how to tell any one patient that you should. I get patients ask me, should I have floral therapy? Then I remind them, look, you're going to pay cash, which is fine. It's safe. Go for it. Try it. I think it's a hit or miss. Um, I like to send my patients to someone I know in Florida uh, who, who will call me back and say, I saw the patient. I don't think it'll help. And that's good. Good for yeah. the patient, right? Yeah. And you asked about stem cell. Um, I don't have experience with that. Um, I talked to the people in Colorado, the Regenex Clinic. I think some people in the crowd may have heard about them. I went there about six, seven years ago. We started getting interested in ligaments and inflammation and all that stuff, which is which these EDS patients are riddled with. Some of the biology makes sense. Um, but here again, it's not a, approved for payers to pay. Medicare doesn't pay for it. No, no payers. So it's all cash stuff. Um, there's a little bit of voodoo about it. Um, it helps some patients. It doesn't help others. They they did not seem to be interested in doing a case series or a a proper study on it. And then when it comes to craniovertebral instability, you're talking about ligaments that are in the most critical part of your body, right? Right near the brainstem, right near the medulla. And how the heck are you going to get a needle to the alar ligament or to the cruciate <laughs> ligament? I have no freaking idea. <laughs> so I I think doing stem cell or PRP or that sort of stuff for this is still a ways to go. I mean, there is a way to get a needle in there. You got to go through the mouth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there is a way to get a needle in there, but um, I I haven't sent any patients for it yet. I, I'm very curious about it. I'm not throwing it off the shelf at all. I think there needs to be a little bit more study about it. And they're just gaining some traction with spine conditions in general, right? So by the time they do that science, I think we'll be ready to try it on patients with chronic vertebral instability. Okay. Um, I kind of want to move on to surgery. We're definitely going to go over it. I apologize, <laughs> but um, I want to at least get through the next couple of sections that I had. Um, first, if a, so this patient was diagnosed as having mild CCI with neurological symptoms though. Um, I guess their question was, is conservative treatment going to be enough? I, how do you know when surgery or fusion is definitely needed? I, I talk about this almost with every patient that I see with CCI. How do I know I'm getting better? And I kind of laugh at that because uh, I said, well, you'll feel better, <laughs> right? This is a clinical problem, right? It's a, you came with clinical symptoms and if your symptoms are stable and your symptoms are getting better, that means your instability may not necessarily get better. Let me remind you, you can have instability with no symptoms, right? I've seen patients who have instability. I get plain x-rays on every patient that, that comes to my clinic with any kind of symptom, I'll get plain x-rays. Sometimes no symptoms, they'll get x-rays because they've got a little bit of ache. And I said, let's get flexion extensions. And wow, whoa, whoa, you've got horrible cranial vertebral instability. Are you sure you're okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I said, well, you got cranial vertebral instability, my friend. You better be careful. No skydiving for you. <laughs> no trampolines for you. That That's a lot of movement there. So how do you know you're getting better symptoms? It's purely symptoms and neurological examination. So when they come in, I do reflex exam, their gait, tandem step gait, position sense. So it's sort of a measure of how well the medulla or the spinal cord's working. Symptoms, you know, what they are, how are your hands doing now? How's your balance doing now? How's your bladder doing now? How's the pain doing, et cetera, et cetera. So just recording all that. And if with physical therapy, activity and functionality are improving, they're not in bed all the time anymore, but they're doing the household chores or they're now out the door or they're walking a mile they never used to walk, then clearly they're getting better and their symptoms are getting better. If I did flex and extension MRI on them when they're better, am I going to see instability? I sure am. They're still lax. Their, their ligaments are still lax, but they're now either their muscles are stronger or the ligaments are not as inflamed anymore, but you're still gonna have your floppy ligaments. 
Now, as we get older, our ligaments do get a little stiffer. You know, we know that. That's why we're not as flexible when we're older. Um, so that, that also happens. You know, EDS patients do get old too. So I think for me, improvement is clinical. It's not radiographic. There was another question. Was that? Well, you, that was basically, uh, how do okay. you know when surgery is necessary? And I assume it's based on symptoms. It is purely based on symptoms. Yeah, I, I tell them in, that if if you came to me the first time and you had just a balance problem, but now you had therapy uh, and uh, the therapy raises their white surrender flag and the patient comes to me and now they're in a wheelchair or their their neurologic exam is worse and I know they have instability, I said, look, you're getting worse. Where do you want to go? I I call the therapist and I say, Susan? Patient so and so, what do you think? I think she's worse, Dr. Patel. You know, I've tried everything possible, but we're just not making progress. So I look at the patient and I said, You want to keep trying? And they say, I'm I'm reached an end. You know, I've 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 even given up playing with my puppy dog. I say, Okay, it's time to do do your uh, surgery now, which is drastic, obviously, you know. We weren't built to have fusions done, but in these patients, they have to have it done. That that segues really well into, I, I think this is an important question because I don't think it's actually been addressed. Um, what is a fusion? <laughs> Are there specific <laughs> techniques and tools that surgeons use to do them? Is there like a right or wrong way? I, I know it's a very drastic surgery, so I mean. Yeah. So how we do the fusion is going to be variable but between surgeons. So. To that question, I will, I will say, you decided to buy a luxury car and you have a choice of a Mercedes, a Lexus, a BMW or whatever, does it really matter? No, maybe you're, you're pro Toyota or pro Lexus or pro German or pro BMW and you'll go for that. But the reality is you get a luxury car. So I, I don't look at, and the approach for the surgery I'm talking about first, also there, you you agree to an approach because that surgeon is so familiar with that and does such a good job in his own experience with that. You know, I get the question so many times when patients said, you know, so-and-so said they use this approach. I said, well, great. That approach works for them. They're used to it. That's the way it works for them. They, and I use this one because the past 200 patients, this approach has worked for me. And and I've been able to achieve fusion. Now, what is a fusion? Fusion just simply is exactly that. It's a fusion. You're fusing two bones together. You're taking, if it's a craniocervical fusion, you're basically welding. Think of fusion is welding. You got two crowbars, you want to weld them together. You got the head and you got the spine bone, you're gonna weld it together because it's too floppy. Fusion is welding. The medical word for fusion is arthrodesis. Arthros is joint. Desis is fusing. So you're taking a joint and making it stop moving. You're taking two bones that are supposed to move with each other through a joint, and you're getting rid of that joint. You get rid of it by growing bone across it. So that's a fusion. How do you achieve a fusion? Well, the day you have the fusion operation, you're not fused. There you're held together with the metal that they put in there, right? So when you break your bone and you go to the orthopedic surgeon, they put a nail in one bone and put a nail in the other one and put a rod right across. What's that for? To hold it together. You're not fused, it's just held together. Or they put a cast around that fracture, they held it together. So that's what the instrumentation is. Again, every surgeon has their own, you know, way of how to put the screw, where to put, but basically what they're doing is they're taking screws and plates to one place or on one bone, putting screws in another bone and putting a rod in between to hold it together. The actual bone growing where the joint becomes fused, where it becomes one bone, takes three to six months. So it's not like uh, you're unstable until then because you've got rods holding things together. But at about six to six, three to six months, the bones grow in. 
And uh, I've had rare patients ask me, well, once they're grown in, why don't you remove the screws? I said, why? It's not bothering you at that point. Yeah. And why put yourself through that painful operation of taking out those screws? So most spine fusions, you put the screws in with the intent of just leaving them in place. Now, there are rare patients where you have to take the rods and screws out, either for infection or the rods are broken and painful or whatever. But does that answer the question of what is a fusion? Yeah. There was actually a follow-up that said, um, how long after the fusion, so you said about three to a, a couple of months until that is considered fused how do you know if the bone is not fusing and do you go back in and try again how do i know it's not so first of all it's a complaint right patient comes back three six nine months at six months i'm like you're still hurting really so i get x-rays look at the x-rays well the screws look like they're in good place the rods didn't break but you then, or sometimes you get x-rays and it looks like the screw is loose. If the x-ray is equivocal, then you get a CT scan. CT scan will show bone better than an MRI. And there is no bone formed. Or that you can see that there's a halo around the screw, meaning the screw is, was put in the bone, but now because the screw is loose, that means there's movement. And so you can see loose screws or broken screws or broken rods, and the patients are having symptoms, then you know that they haven't fused. Is there a certain amount of time though? Is it just after that window of when you expect the fusion to? Of course, everybody heals differently and at different yeah. speeds, right? Some people fuse in three months, some people take six to nine months. As long as the instrumentation or as long as the screws and rods look intact and they're not loose in the bone, then I tell them, look, you just, I'm not worried about the bony growth. Now, if they're two years out and the screws and everything is fine and there's still no bone, then you start looking for reasons. So, well, I'm glad the screws are holding your head to your neck, but you got no bone there. Um, why haven't you grown any bone? You got some metabolic bone disease. You got, uh, what, osteoporosis. You got some calcium metabolism problem. I called the endocrinologist and the rheumatologist and say, can you assess this patient or give them something to help them with bone growth? Okay. Um, this is an interesting question. Can a Chiari decompression cause instability in a patient who has EDS? Yes. Yeah. The answer is yes. That's how I got into this, right? So I did a Chiari decompression on patients. And as I mentioned earlier in the beginning of this uh, session, there were a small percent of patients, about one in five, that just never got better. They got worse, some of them. I said, why they get worse? You look at their MRI and their Chiari is decompressed. There's a good bit of room there, but they're still having Chiari-like symptoms. And it turned out that they had instability. And so now, even if it's a clear bona fide Chiari with a cork like, everything is tight, they have Chiari symptoms, I always get, at minimum, I'll get flexion extension x rays just to see if there's instability too. But why they become instable after the Chiari decompression? Well, to do the Chiari decompression, you're peeling off all that bone, all that muscle that's holding your head. To your neck. That's the only way to get down to the bone that you need to remove to do the Chiari decompression. You peel that muscle off, <laughs> now your head ain't connected to your neck very well. And then you, of course, stitch that back, but it's never going to be attached as well, right? So you are making them a little unstable with a decompression. And so it's important to know before surgery for Chiari. In, and that's what I teach my trainees. It's not anywhere in the textbook. I say, look, you got a carry. Pictures are great. Your symptoms are perfect. You've got a carry one, uh, even maybe a syrinx. Get a flexion extension x-ray too. Just make sure they're not unstable. If they're not unstable, go ahead and do it. Always tell the patient, say, look, we're going to do a carry decompression. You're not unstable before. There's a teensy-beensy chance that because of the surgery, you may become a little more unstable. 
Um, this is interesting. So how do you determine the right position of the head when you're doing a fusion? I know because in a way they kind of, it gets like frozen there because it gets fused and it can't really move around too, too much. Um, yeah. 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 I don't know. You're, yeah. That's a very good question. You have to be very careful how you fuse the head to the neck, right? Because the position of your head on your neck has to be perfect. It has to be perfect for the medulla. It has to be perfect for all the things that depend on your head sitting right on your neck. What depends on that? We talked about it. Your vision, your hearing, your arm and leg function, your swallowing, right? If you fuse, I don't know whether people see my head right now. If you fuse somebody like that, I can't even swallow, I can't even talk, right? So you fuse them like this, they cannot even swallow, right? Or too stretched up. People, sometimes some surgeons like to do traction. Be careful. Sometimes that traction can be too much, right? So what do we do during surgery? Again, it seems like every surgeon has their own little recipe book. <laughs> Whatever works for them, I'm okay with it. Um, but during surgery, we have x-rays. We get x-rays to make sure the alignment of the head and neck looks okay. I like to look at the jaw. I make sure doing surgery that the anesthesia haven't stuffed a bunch of stuff into the mouth, you know, to make it abnormal. Um, and then intra e them like that. You can see inside too. You make sure everything looks, you know, you don't want to fuse. <laughs> a drastic example, but you know, you can see how the bones are just aligned perfectly. The x-rays look good and the, even in the positioning of the patient on the special bed that the head looks normal and you get x-rays to make sure the head looks normal on the neck. So there are a variety of different measures and angles and each of us uses, you know, our own favorite sets of angles but any surgeon who says look yeah we we really focus on making sure the alignment is good before we lock things down because you don't want to lock them in the wrong way and even after doing that i i do warn patients i said look you're having oc fusion i'm gonna guess that the your what would be your best position most neutral position to allow you to swallow and eat and do properly and and function normally there's a teeny possibility that Sometimes it may not be the best guess. You might have a little swallowing trouble or you might have a little voice issue. And I have to admit, yeah, some patients have had it. But in those patients, I just say, look, give it three to six months, see how you do. And maybe there will be a little retraining of your muscles to function properly. But most of the time, if you use the x-ray guidance and the angle measurements and everything properly, you don't get into trouble with that. Long explanation for a short question, sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine, it's good. Kind of coming off that, um, I know we talked about it with Chiari uh, surgery causing instability, but can CCI surgery cause instability elsewhere in the spine? Is that something that might happen afterward? Yeah, there's a general thought among anybody who does spine fusion surgeries that if you fuse one segment, then the segment above and below are strained more, which makes sense. And, and so as we get older, the more strained discs will become more degenerated and so you can develop instability. So that's a yes. But there's a no answer to it too, which is what I explained to. And the best way to think about it is if your head is not sitting right at the top of the peg, okay, you got a head, which is 25 pounds, and it's sitting on your neck, and you've got CCI, so your head is floppy. It's already putting a lot of strain on your neck by just being floppy, right? It's leaning towards one side. Let's say it's leaning forward, so your center of gravity is just not right. That in itself puts strain on your neck too, right? A lot of, a lot of patients have so much instability that even in the middle of their neck is looking bent forward <laughs> because the head is not the center of gravity of your head is not properly aligned to the axis of the spine itself. So that puts a lot of fulcrum or, or strain, gravitational strain on the neck itself. 
by simply straightening or fixing the CCI, you're less straining the neck. So I see some instability in the neck and I say, look, you've got bad CCI, but you've got some instability in your neck already. I think if we stabilize the top, your instability in your neck might get better. And I've seen patients like that. But I've also seen patients who they they do come back and they have instability, worse instability in their neck. So I think it's important to assess for it before the surgery for CCI to make sure that the neck is not super, super unstable already. In fact, there have been rare patients where they were so unstable in the neck. I said, look, you need to fix your neck first before we fix the CCI. Okay, we're definitely going to go over I'm going to try and con collapse a lot of these questions. Um, this came up a couple of times even in the chat. So is it possible during surgery to tell if there's a, a leak somewhere or some torn dura um, if you're doing a CCI surgery or I guess anywhere on the spine? Yeah, I mean, when you're doing uh, the spine operation at the location where you did the surgery, yeah, you should be able to tell whether they're dura because you don't see a whole lot of dura, right? So at least not when I do the surgery. When I do the surgery for cranial vertebral junction, I, I try to stay away from the dura completely. I just expose the bone itself and if there's soft tissue between the vertebra that's laying and there are veins on the dura, I leave those alone. I don't want to futz with that. But if there's an obvious leak, uh, you can see it. But sometimes you may not. Uh, sometimes you create the leak yourself, right? You're taking the, away the muscles from the bone, and as you're doing that, you can pull or tug, or your cautery that you use may, uh, the tissues are so soft and fragile that you can create the leaks that way. Um, sometimes when you're putting the screw into the bone and you you know, you look at the x-rays while you're looking at this or you put the screw in, but the bone is very thin. The screw can also create a leak. It's very rare to see that. Mm -hmm. Now, you cannot tell if there's a leak in some other part of the spine, obviously. Because it's, not, it's not like a whole lot that comes out. But one, one maneuver that I always do is once the operation's done, the fusion's done, and before I close, I dry up everything and I tell the anesthesiologist, do a Valsalva maneuver. Valsara, where they artificially can increase the pressure in the head. And if there's any bit of fluid leaking, you can see it. I've never seen it in the fusions that I've done, but I think it's a good practice after spine surgery to say, all right, I'm done now. Do a Valsara. Let's make sure we don't leave a leak behind. Um, I'm going to do a couple of like miscellaneous and even some research-ish questions. So first... Um, is MUSC, or I guess anyone really, doing any analysis, I'm assuming they mean like histopathology of tissue removed from like surgeries during CCI, like for CCI or PRE or anything like that. Is, is that something that's being studied right now or no? Um, so every institution's kind of doing different things. The one thing that uh, not related to CCI, well, directly. But these patients with CCI, some of them have tethered cord syndrome. So in patients with tethered cord syndrome, uh, we are removing the phylum, uh, which is what's causing the, and we do collect the phylum and, and store it with the hope that one day we'll look at the phylum collected from EDS patients and compare it to the phylum in, in patients that are normal. We have a we have a tissue bank at MUSC. There are many academic institutions that have the tissue bank and you just bank the tissue with their blood and their whatever tissue. In a true CCI operation, we're not removing any tissue, right? There's no reason to remove any. So we don't have a study where I say, oh, by the way, while we're doing surgery, we can take a little snippet of your muscle and store it. We don't do that. We're not doing it right now and I don't, I, I the only other EDS study we have, so we're collecting phylum. Oh yeah, so all our patients now uh, with suspected HEDS for whatever and with whatever presentation they have, we are collecting their blood, no, their saliva 
Now, one of our cardiologists who, who also treats their POTS, uh, his PhD collaborator has found a gene. Again, there are many, many collagen genes, right? So he's just uncovered one of the gene. Uh, so we're testing all those patients to see if, if they have that uh, gene deformity that he has found in some patients with cardiovascular symptoms. But he wants to see if this is common to all HEDS patients with or without POTS. So in terms of studies, MUSC only has that salivary test for presumed EDS patients. And especially of interest to us is the, the patient who has family members with history of hypermobile joints, et cetera, et cetera. Then we'll do that. And then I am collecting uh, the phylum on patients with tethered cord, but we're not doing any tissue studies on CCI fusions. I guess since it came up, um, how often does tethered cord occur maybe in CCI patients or even after CCI surgery? Is that common? Or? Uh, no, it feels like it's common, but it's not common. Um, most of the time, if you get a very good history on a patient, they have tethered cord symptoms when they present to you with CCI. And so when I see that, like they'll say, you know, they have all these cranial symptoms, medullary symptoms, carry like symptoms, cranial vertebral instability, et cetera. And then you ask them, do you have back pain? Oh yeah. You have urinary symptoms. Well, I have hesitancy, urgency, um, occasional incontinence, et cetera. Then I do mention to them that this could possibly get worse or possibly better. And I've seen it going both ways. You stabilize their cranial cervical instability and their tethered core symptoms seem to get better. But some of them, they do get worse and you have to detether them down below. But I've never seen somebody with absolutely zero back pain, no tethering symptoms. You fuse them. I have at least not encountered a patient that develops the tethering. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I promised only three more. <laughs> okay. One is I can combine these two. So um, a couple of people asked even before we got on tonight, um, what can patients do, other healthcare professionals, nurses, other doctors, how can we all help better educate other medical professionals who maybe don't know as much about EBS or instability or how to treat these patients because they're they're pretty complex. Um, just is there anything that we can do on our end to help you, I guess, help more people? Um, yeah, I think that's a very complicated question because um, we're doing everything we can, right? So we're doing symposia and we do as much writing as we can and publishing. And, and you have to remember, this is such a complex thing that we also have a lot of questions about it. Right? Those of us who have taken interest in it is just because uh, we just can't let go of these patients. We can't tell them, no time for you. I got the other 99 patients who I know what's going on. I'm not going to waste my time on you. That's understandable. So. Um, I think it'll happen in time, but what you're really asking, what does a patient do? You know, for example, this, this forum is fine, right? It's great because we're, we're educating more people who might have it and they can relay it to their physicians. You can, you can, it would be nice if you can take some literature or some material to an interested physician. How do you make your providers more interested in it? Um, I don't know the answer to that, honestly. I I can speak of myself. So, you know, I'm one of those people that if you come to me and I don't understand your problem, but then you pull out a piece of a paper and you say, would you read this and tell me about it? I'll do it. Because I'm like, I don't know what's going on with you. Oh, you did your own homework? Very good. You know, you become Dr. Google. I like that. Right. I like to talk to patients who want to learn. Right. And but not all providers are that way or not all providers have the time. So I think, unfortunately, I, I don't have the answer. I think doing more of what you're doing now, I'm assuming that some of this is recorded. Um, help us to publish, you know, help us with registries. I think the CSF has registries. Um, and the last time I, I was involved, you know, 
you that that registry uh, will provide the data we need to publish and if we can publish that's disseminating scientific knowledge and as physicians we're all trained to look at scientific data right most if not all of us hopefully all of us but most of us practice on evidence base right and evidence is science right and science comes from data and so how does a patient help us help us with the research enroll in any study close to you if there's a genetic study all you got to do is spit in that test tube spit in it all right oh all i got to do is get this kind of x-ray do it all i got to do is call aunt minnie and my two nephews and them and and they're going to do these x-rays or get a history on me do it register go online go to this foundation i i you know if there's a registry and a questionnaire rope your providers into it say look i've got this questionnaire i need to and they need this information you never know you provide now oh, that's curious what's this about you know that kind of thing so i think you can participate in it you know there's a famous i'm gonna ramble now it's eight o'clock nearly nine o'clock <laughs> There's a famous neurosurgeon in Montreal. He's long gone. His name was Wilder Penfield. He's very famous because he's one of the founding fathers of neurosurgery in the world. Anybody who's a neurosurgeon knows who Wilder Penfield is. And there's a story that one day he was having dinner with his trainees. And, you know, they were rambling on. And these are the trainees that eventually got trained in Montreal in 1940s and came to the United States. And a lot of them were chairmen of departments. Anyway, getting back to that dinner, one of his trainees asked, he said, Dr. Penfield, what can I, what kind of research should I do? And Dr. Penfield got very upset with him. He said, that is the most stupidest question. How could you ask me what kind of research you should do? And I'll never forget this story. I was not there, but I, this story was told to me, my mentor who was at that dinner in 1940. Dr. Penfield told the trainee, he said, ask your patient, right? So tell us what kind of research we need to do. And, and you go to one provider, you go to another one, you go to another one, you just ask them questions. You, you're the ones who are going to lead our efforts and push it, whether it's publicly or whatever, and say, you know, something's got to be done about this, you know, and, and many of us will pay attention to that. Some of us are already paying attention and we're drowning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really true. I, I'm actually about to put something in uh, the chat because um, we just relaunched our patient registry with a new um, partner to make everything a little bit more secure and way more um, objective. We're going to have medical records included in our patient registry, which is like huge. So yep. I'm just going to quickly do that. Uh, <laughs> but um, the there's only two other questions. Actually, it's one question. Um, because we can't fit anything else, we'll have to do one other of these, if you don't mind coming back. Sure. Um, sure. But I just wanted to, I always try to end with this question. Um, are you seeing patients remotely? Can you have images sent? Um, I know there's been a little bit of a lax in the very strict uh, statewide kind of rules right now because of COVID. But how can people find you? Are you accepting new patients even from farther away? How is that kind of something that, I, I guess, um, how could people get in touch with you specifically? With me specifically. So my situation is unique. I, I am an employee of a state institution. Medical University of South Carolina is a state institution. So I'm a state employee and my license is to practice only in South Carolina. Um, and so quite in, in a very legal way, I'm, I'm not supposed to see patients from out of state. Now, I still see patients from out of state. The way I see them is they come to me and I, and I see them. So mm -hmm. they're here in Charleston, uh, I can see them. Now, to the question of remote, I can see patients remotely anywhere in South Carolina. So I'm not gonna suggest that you hop across the border, <laughs> flip on your computer and say, hey, I'm at McDonald's on just this side <laughs> of South I've had that, 
I've had that happen to me. <laughs> Where are you at? I'm at McDonald in Aiken. Aiken, but you live in Ohio. Yeah, we drove down. <laughs> okay. Anyway, that, you're visiting but, family, but, of course. <laughs> but the good news on my end is I, I, I treat a lot of these conditions that a lot of people wanted me to see these. Uh, so we just this week uh, have are about to contract with a company which will remove or shield us from the legal stuff. And basically what this will mean is that whoever wants me to to consult or see their films or look at their history will work through this company and there you go. <laughs> but we should we we are still seeing patients from out of state. If they call for an appointment, you know, and want to fly down to Charleston, it's a beautiful city by the way. Um you come down here, I can see you in clinic. There's no problem with that. Um, but if you are, you're stuck where you are, you cannot move, you have films, then very shortly, probably in within the next two, three months, we should have this system where you'll have a link, this company that the university hospital is gonna set up with, and you upload everything or you mail everything to them, and then I can work through them and, and they're doing something legally where I'm not liable for my opinions or whatever. Right. But awesome. you know, I, I, um, I can't publicly go out and say that I'm seeing remote patients. Right. Do I yeah. see patients remotely? I think it's still happening. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> but that's fine. So, but if someone were to come into the clinic, they could just find you. Um, I'm assuming online. Uh, can. Yeah, uh, there's a scheduling office, or when you when you click on the MUSC thing and you look at me, they'll say you know to schedule an appointment. Here's who you call, etc. Yeah, you okay. can you can make an appointment. That's not a problem. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, it's a good question. Do you see children? So do you see adults and kids? Yeah, they've made exception for me to see kids. And at MUSC, there's a special children's clinic and a children's hospital. But when patients have special problems, you may feel like you're going through a little bit of trouble getting through, but I've seen children. There may be a few people here that I've already seen their children and I they come in a adult clinic. There are no toys to play there for them, but <laughs> bring your own iPad, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um so to have the kids seen, um, it's the same process though. They just try to make an appointment. Yeah, what will happen is sometimes what happens is you know, they call the schedulers, and if and there are many schedulers in our system, they're for the whole set. There are twelve hundred doctors here, so if you get a schedule that doesn't realize that I'm seeing children too, then you might get a little bit of a runaround, but most of them will contact me and say, so-and-so called about their eight-year-old, nine-year-old with EDS. Uh, are you seeing these patients? And then I'll say, of course I am. Yeah, set them up for my North Charleston clinic. So okay. There may be a little query thing. So if people with children want me to see them call and they get the, just ask the scheduler, hey, listen, can you ask Dr. Patel whether he would make an exception? So. Right, okay. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so, so much for doing this, Dr. Patel. I'm apologizing because we have to make you come back because there were an insane amount of questions that we did not address. But no problem. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. And I'm very much looking forward to next time. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye.